In this video, we're going to continue our conversation of air, air conditioning troubleshooting. But I want to go over some quick checks that you can use in, in a tight time frame situation or a situation where you need to narrow down what's happening with a piece of equipment relatively quickly. We want to use quick checks to locate a potential problem. We want to use quick checks over the course of a preventative maintenance prior to touching or doing any work on a system. You don't want to be blamed for breaking something that's already broken. You want to use quick checks for the basis of an estimate. You do not want to use quick checks to fully diagnose and repair a system. Don't use quick checks during any loss or insurance inspection. Don't use any um, quick checks while you're doing a real estate inspection or a property mechanical inspection. The quick checks are that just that. These are rules of thumb and they do not, um, every piece of equipment out there will not equally hit these and I'll try to identify them as we go through these. Remember, a rule of thumb, okay, is something that's just an average, okay? Quick checks are a rule of thumb. Quick checks are not a final and complete result. Each system is going to be a little bit different, and it's impossible to account for these differences in rule of thumb numbers. And this I have bold, sort of in red because it's important. The, high, the higher efficiency 13 plus SEER equipment may have numbers that fall outside of these rules of thumb, but these will still point you in the correct direction. So before we start these, we need to make sure we have a working system that is just not cooling properly. Okay, in other words, you have airflow, the compressor is running, the condenser is running, and we have refrigerant moving. Okay, so you have to have a working system. But what we're looking at a system is possibly not cooling correctly. Not enough cooling is an average service call for this. So we want to turn the system off, okay? This first check is extremely important, especially as we have newer refrigerants out here. Wait for the pressures to equalize. So you have your gauges on the system and your pressures are going to equalize. Take the temperature of the center of the evaporator coil. Use the low side pressure and temperature to verify that the correct refrigerant is in the system. Now this gets extremely important when we start talking about blends. If the system is an R22 system and it appears the refrigerant in the system is not R22 based on your pressure readings, inspect the system and determine if someone used the R407C drop-in. R407 fractionates, so if there's a small leak someplace in the system, the components of the blend will leak out at different rates and leave you with something that is not 407C. Okay. So what happens is if there's a small leak that someone recharged a system with the drop-in, okay, and it used to be an R22 system and now is the drop-in, but if there's a small leak, the blend will actually separate if there's a leak, okay, and you'll be left with something that is not 407C and it's not going to cool properly. Incorrect refrigerants have to be recovered. The system must be leak tested, evacuated, and recharged. Okay, you cannot go further with these quick checks if you do not have the correct refrigerant in the system. The other thing I have been hearing and seeing lately is that people have tried to convert R22 systems on their own to R410A. Again, it's very important you know this before this whole process starts. So make sure you have the correct refrigerant. If an equalized system with a coil that's now equalized pressures, you take the temperature and it does not match, you have a refrigerant problem. Once the refrigerant has been verified, restart the system. The remainder of these quick checks, again, cannot be accomplished if the system does not run. Allow the system to run if possible until the space temperature is in with 5 to 10 degrees of design. Now, design does not mean what the customer wants to achieve. Sometimes there's a little bit of wishful thinking in there. Design means what the average system in your part of the country is designed to maintain given that outdoor temperature. Most often, these are 20 degree difference between inside and outside temperatures. For example, if the design is to maintain a 75 degree indoor temperature for 95 degree outdoor temperature. 
Now, there's one important note here that we have to continue to take into account. In humid areas, okay, like the Deep South, Florida, Texas, okay, in humid areas, the design temperatures may change for extremely humid days. The higher the humidity, the lower the temperature difference between outdoor and indoor temperatures, okay? In other words, if you're maintaining 75 degree indoor temperature for 95 degree outside temperature on a 40% humidity day, you might hit your 20 degree temperature difference. But if you're maintaining 75 degree indoor for 95 degree outside with a 95% humidity, it may not hit that 20 degree difference, okay, because there's latent heat involved, which I'm not going to go heavily into, but we have to remove the humidity from the air. So let's start off with the suction pressures. And again, this is an average, okay? If you're over a 13 sear system, which there's a lot out there, you may fall slightly outside these averages, okay? So don't panic. It may still be working properly. Suction pressure should be in the range of 35 to 40 degrees below the return air temperature. Now, when I'm talking suction pressures, you're going to take that suction pressure, you're going to... That's your low side pressure. You're going to use your temperature pressure chart to convert to the temperature or pressure, depending on how you look at it. So if my return air temperature is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, okay, my suction pressure should be 45 degrees Fahrenheit for whatever refrigerant you're using. Okay, something I've said in other videos, which is important to restate here, I really don't care about pressures. The pressures are a tool for me to find temperature, okay? It's possible to do an entire system check without putting your gauges on a system as long as you know where to take the temperatures. But in this case, we're going to use gauges, okay? Discharge pressure should be 20 to 35 degrees above the outside air temperature. Again, high side pressure converted to temperature. Superheat should be between 15 degree, 15 to 20 degrees at the compressor. Now, I know somebody's out there saying, whoa, 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 wait a second. Superheat should be 8 to 12 degrees. Okay, there's a difference between system superheat and evaporator superheat. Now, again, this is one of these numbers that based on the efficiency of your equipment, based on what expansion device you're using. Is it a fixed orifice? Is it a TXV? Okay, this number can change a little bit, okay? It's going to be lower at higher efficiency equipment. So, but again, to get, temp to get superheat, look at the temperature of the suction line at compressor minus the low side temperature. Subcooling. 8 to 15 degrees at the outlet of the receiver or condenser. And again, the higher the efficiency equipment, okay, this number is going to change a little bit, okay? But subcooling is your high side temperature minus the temperature of the liquid line. How are you going to get the high side temperature? You're going to take your high side gauge and you're going to convert it to temperature. Another pretty important number that a lot of people miss is the temperature split across the filter dryer. Temperature split across a filter dryer should be zero. Use a clamp-on thermometer and take the liquid line temperature at both sides of the filter dryer. Any number higher than zero with properly calibrated equipment means there's a blockage in the filter dryer. Condenser air temperature rise is important as well. It's the air temperature rise through the condenser. Okay, should be about 20 to 30 degrees. Now, again, I have another video on this that I just posted late last week that gives you more exact numbers. Okay, efficiency of the equipment, the sear of the equipment matters a great deal in this reading. Okay, so you're going to see differences here. You might need to, for higher efficiency equipment, you might need to look at manufacturer specs. But again, this is just a rule of thumb number. Put a thermometer on the top of the condenser, measuring the outlet air, and one on the inlet air. Keep the position of the sun in mind. You want the air temperature. You do not want the radiation temperature from the sun rays, okay? So try to do this temperature not in direct sunlight, because you don't want your thermometer to pick up the temperature of the sun. 
subtract these two numbers. Also, a lot of people have you tried to use infrared thermometers getting these readings. They do not work as well as, a, as an actual thermometer you pull air across. Subtract the two numbers, that gives you your temperature rise. Evaporator air temperature drop. Okay, this is basically your delta T, okay, temperature split. Should be between 13 and 20 degrees. This number will vary based on humidity. Remember I told you humidity has latent heat in it. Basically, the more humidity, the lower the temperature split will be because a lot of the cooling power is going to remove that humidity from the system. Okay, temperature drop through the evaporator, 13 to 20 degrees. And again, higher efficiency equipment, you may see different numbers. But again, rule of thumb. So what readings do you need to do this? Okay, basically you're taking seven readings. Okay, well, eight, but section pressure converted to suction temperature. High side pressure converted to condensing temperature. You're going to take two temperature readings at the liquid line filter dryer, one before it and one after it. Okay, make sure those thermometers are calibrated correctly. Return air temperature, supply air temperature, condenser intake, that's your ambient air temperature. Again, watch the sunlight. Condenser discharge air temperature. Okay, right on top of the fan, but make sure you don't drop your probe into the fan or you won't have a probe left anymore. So again, I just want to restate that these are rules of the thumb. You do not want to use these for a full diagnosis like we've been talking about. But this is a great way to get started. And also in an emergency situation or a situation where you need to give a quote, this is where you would start.